name is Corinne Fagare, and I'm the coordinator of the Pacific Calling Partnership at the Edmund Rice Centre. Um, I'm pleased to welcome Sister Jan Barnett, who will be facilitating the evening tonight. Jan, welcome. Thank you very much, Corinne. Hello, everyone. Can you believe it's only six weeks till COP26? What a challenging and highly charged moment this is for us all. The poet Seamus Heaney tells us, history says, don't hope on this side of the grave. But then once in a lifetime, the longed for tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope and history rhyme. And it's honestly my strong belief that at this moment, we are experiencing that longed for tidal wave of justice. Our presence at this webinar and the passion of the speakers who I know will inspire and challenge us, remind us that we are in truth in the very eye of the storm and the eye of that tidal wave. Welcome to all of you from across the Pacific and Australia. And tonight, we want to give a really special welcome to our Pacific Island sisters and brothers. Welcome to you all. It's wonderful that you can join us. I'm Jane Barnett at Josephite, and I'm honoured to welcome each of you to tonight's webinar. As we begin, we acknowledge, as we always do, the traditional peoples of the lands from which we come. And we recognise, especially in this COVID time, their witness to us of their connectedness to land and our responsibility to care for Earth and the whole of creation. It's a cliche, I know, but aren't you struck in this weird and frightening time across our world, and there are more than 450 registered for this event, that this moment, as we prepare for COP26, that this event tonight is a particularly unique gift to us. So especially, I do want to thank Corinne and the Edmund Rice Centre's Pacific Calling Partnership for making this event possible. You do so much, and not just for nights such as this. On a regular basis, your day-to-day non-stop fidelity to Earth and the Pacific motivates and encourages the rest of us. Tonight's webinar couldn't have come at a more critical time. Climate emissions are surging as Glasgow draws near, and the Australian government is still choosing to endorse and promote a gas-fuelled future. It's continuing its anti-renewables agenda, barely challenged by Labor. And we do know, don't we, that as long as this government refuses to take significant steps to reduce emissions, the very future and existence of the Pacific Islands, our family, as the Australian Prime Minister is so keen to remind us, faces catastrophic danger. So there is much at stake, for the Pacific especially, but also for us all. In the face of the clear emergencies confronting us, we do indeed welcome the four extraordinary leaders who will speak to us tonight and how blessed we are that you can be with us. I have no doubt at all that the world desperately needs the message of challenge and hope that you will bring us. And it's for this call and ongoing conversion that we earnestly pray as we begin tonight in the words of the Jesuit, Louis Espinal Camps. Train us, God, to fling ourselves upon the impossible, for within the impossible is your grace and your presence. We cannot fall into emptiness. The future is an enigma. Our road is covered by mist, but we want to go on giving ourselves because you continue hoping amid the night and weeping through a thousand human eyes. Amen. Archbishop Peter Loy Chong from Suva, Reverend Mata Javier Helio, moderator elect of the Uniting Church in New South Wales and ACT, 
Reverend James Bagwan, General Secretary of the Pacific Conference of Churches and Bishop Vincent Long from Parramatta join us tonight as witnesses and truth sayers, I think, for our time. And we welcome you all. Thanks so much. Our presenters will speak up to 10 minutes each. Following this, there'll be another 20 minutes for questions. Corinne, the coordinator of the Pacific Calling Partnership at the Edmund Rice Centre, will then offer us some specific ideas about possible practical action prior to COP26. The webinar will conclude at approximately 6.30, but could I just remind you as we begin that your microphone will be muted if you're not speaking. And this event is being conducted as a Zoom call and will be recorded. So if your camera is on, you can be seen by everybody. If you don't wish to be seen for any reason, please do remember to switch your camera off. And also, if you have questions, you can type them into the chat and we'll get to them after the four speakers have concluded their 10 minute inputs. And so, on to the business of the night. Our first speaker, Archbishop Peter Loy Chong from Suva, comes to us as a distinguished leader in Fiji and the Pacific. He speaks from his invaluable background, wisdom and leadership in the Pacific, pulling no punches in naming the climate emergency and highlighting the urgency of the summons facing us. And as he's reminded many audiences, the fate of the Pacific is the fate of the whole world. Tonight, he'll share with us his perspectives on the climate emergency facing the Pacific and its implications. His message is critically relevant for our government and for all of us as Australians. Archbishop, your knowledge and passion about the climate threat to Pacific Island nations, especially Fiji, your environmental videos, songs such as the climate change lament, complete with rap we understand, provide both joy and challenge. Archbishop, we're delighted to welcome you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, dear friends. I'd just like to play a short uh, poem by a young girl and a poem that she's converted also into a song. So let me share this uh, screen. God created the universe without a face, shape, or case. He said, let there be light, and bam, everything came into sight. We are stewards to God's creation. Air, water, and food, we are given free vegetation. We took everything for granted, and that's when the catastrophe started. Global warming came along. We humans are the cause. Weather changes and disaster rages. Pollution rises with a changing climate. Today, our planet is at risk because of our very own human greed. Wake up, came a distress cry. Everything is about to die. I plant my own food, just like that other family from the crudes. You must pick up your rubbish or else we will all tarnish. Protect Mother Earth now fiercely, or else global warming will be beastly.
Bula. I am Archbishop Peter Chong from the Fiji Islands. I sit behind a tanoa, which is a wooden bowl for mixing the traditional drink and customary drink of the Fijian people, the kava or the angona, as a sign of welcome and hospitality. And welcome to this short presentation from the ocean islands here in Fiji. I come from the village. My maternal village is Nateleira and uh, it is located just near the ocean. And growing near the ocean means many things to me. As a child, the ocean is the distant voice that I hear in the quiet of the night, gently roaring of waves as it hit the reefs. As children, the ocean is entertainment, recreation, fun, and joy. Either it was swimming, or paddling around with our bilimbili, bamboo raft. The ocean for us too is food bank. It's where we collect sidi or seashells or, and small crabs after school so that we can have seafood for dinner. Or it's going out to dinner in the night. Dinner is taking a torch or a light in the night to catch seafood. Uh, it's also fishing the near, near reefs or near the Yamut, which is a small detached reef where fish normally congregate. The ocean also is economy, money for life. My uncle was a fisherman. He had a boat with a 40 horsepower engine. He will spend the night with his crew fishing. The sound of the outboard engine in the early morning brings a lot of excitement, excitement to us children and uh, hope we look forward to see the catch of the night and hope that we can have some of the fish or maybe the leftover from the bait for lunch with nice fish soup. Today, thanks to science, I now add more to my little story of the ocean. Today I know that the ocean is a very important part of the planet and of life in general. The ocean uh, produces 70% uh, of the Earth's oxygen, more than the, sea, uh, the rainforests, which only produces about 27%. Uh, the ocean also covers like 70% of the surface of the Earth. And uh, so ocean is life because of oxygen. Today I also learned that the ocean uh, is home to many living creatures in this planet. The ocean and the, the mangrove are home to many living creatures and a lot of them lovely seafood. The ocean today I also have come to learn is important to the Earth's climate. In many ways, the ocean regulates, keeps the Earth's climate uh, steady. The ocean is also and continues to be a source of food. Uh, the ocean is uh, the number one source for protein, which is uh, a necessary part of our diet. In short, I have come to learn that this beautiful ocean is necessary for the climate and more important for the health and the care of our mother home, the planet. Bumbu Sireli, or my grandpa Sireli, my maternal grandfather, built his house just about 50 meters from the seashore and uh, the whole village is actually located the the Natalera village is located right next to the seashore and living by the seashore in Fiji was considered a civilized lifestyle because you have access to seafood it is considered a little bit uncivilized to be living up in the high mountains about 40 years ago my maternal my grandfather's house uh, Bumbu Sireli's house was burnt and when he rebuilt his house he moved to higher ground. We did not know then but today we assume that he had noticed the sea level progressively rising. Global warming and uh, coral bleaching 
are two related events. The air warms up, it warms up the ocean, and because of the heat, the coral will die, and that affects the ocean ecosystem. But we also know of stories that harm this beautiful ocean. The increasing carbon emission is also, uh, which uh, increases the acid in the ocean, is also harmful to our beloved ocean. Some human activities are also harming our beautiful ocean. Overfishing by overseas big fishing boats are killing many fish. And uh, because of the drop in the fish population, this too has an impact, uh, uh, a bad impact on the living creatures that the droplets of the fish give, and uh, they too will die. Before, fishing was simply a small boat like my uncle's, to fish and to sell, to fish or to eat. But now, there are big commercial boats that take in everything from the top of the ocean right down to the bottom. Extractive industries are also making our mother ocean groan and cry. The Virtua women tell this story as a result of the black sand in the, uh, uh, industry in one of our coastal villages. Black sand was extracted from the seashore to be exported. Catching crabs and selling uh, them is the main income of these women, women. But since the black sand mining, the crabs are gone. But also gone is the economic sustenance, the life uh, that supports these women. The ocean is also spirituality for us. Many of our tribes have their gods uh, located in the sea, or the sea is the abode of their gods. Uh, most of the Fijian tribes have totems in the sea. My maternal clan, uh, their sea totem is the milkfish, or the yawa in Fijian. And we consider totems to be sacred we do not name people by their totems or call their totems in front of them. It's, a, it's an insult to their sacredness. And so the ocean is sacred. It is like it has the mark of God, the breath of God. And so, dear friends, as we prepare for COP26, I hope that the voices of the ocean peoples, our stories will touch, move hearts and minds, and bring about behavioral changes for the care of our common home. We hope that the Oceania stories will disturb, interrupt, and waken our global leaders and also big companies for them to see the harm that they are doing to us, the ocean peoples. The COP26 goals are clear. Stop fossil fuel, stop the overfishing, stop the seashore extractive industries, and let's care for our beloved home. Thank you and Vinak. Thank you so much, Archbishop, for such a critically relevant message. Well, thank you formally at the end, but you've given us much to reflect on and act on.
Our second speaker tonight is Reverend Mata Javier Helio. Reverend Mata is a Tongan born Australian woman. She's an ordained minister in the Uniting Church, currently in ministry with Northern Beaches Uniting Church in Sydney. Reverend Mata was recently appointed as moderator of the Uniting Church for New South Wales and ACT and will take up her appointment in 2023. We know, Reverend Mutter, that you have a heart for social and climate justice and that you welcome opportunities to weave your voice into climate conversations and action. Your particular contribution from a woman's perspective and your understanding of the climate emergency within the reality of faith and the Pacific Islands will certainly bring together many strands for us tonight. Reverend Mutter, you are a gift to us and we welcome you. Thank you so much, uh, Sister Jan, for the introduction. Uh, Malolele and greetings to all of you in the name of God, who is indeed Father, Son and Holy Spirit. I too want to acknowledge the land of the Goringai people here in the northern beaches of Sydney, where I live and serve God's people as I pay my respects to the elders who have passed, those that are present, and young Indigenous leaders who will emerge now and into the future. Friends, listen. Listen to the cry of the earth, a call to action, a statement that is familiar to many of you here tonight. Environmental refugee is a term I use and refer to in climate change conversation. I first heard the term from one of my professors, Reverend Dr. Clive Pearson, in reference to a Bible study he led on ecotheology and the confronting impact on global warming that will see people in the Pacific become environmental refugee to the, due to the rising sea levels, swallowing small, beautiful Pacific islands. This encounter was 10 years ago when I was a minister at North Ride Community Uniting Church. Fast forward to 2021, what action has been taken? I'm sure for many of us, the Paris Agreement in COP21 in 2015 holds nations accountable, but more and more action is needed, hence why we are here tonight. And here we are preparing again for COP26 in November of this year. I have to admit that when Corinne invited me to be a speaker tonight, my response to her was referring her to the expert of the Uniting Church advocacy team on climate action. But her response to me was to say, yes, but you are from the Pacific. And so friends, here I am offering words as a Pacific woman, an ordained minister, a leader, a follower of Jesus, a mother, a weaver, collaborator of Dalanoa, here to share my cry for action. I am a Pacific woman. I was born in Tonga and have been privileged to have grown up here and live here in Australia. The impact of climate change, as many of us are aware, in the Pacific is already being felt and seen with confronting images of the rising sea levels in the islands of Kiribati and Tuvalu, to name two. There have been extreme changes as reported to the weather pattern causing flooding, drought, earthquakes, tsunamis, and so much more. I was eight years old when I first experienced the reality and impact of being in a cyclone. It was Cyclone Isake or Isaac in 1982. And again, Cyclone Waka on New Year's Eve when I was sitting in church in 2001 in the islands, in my parents' island of Vavau. That fear I felt as a helpless child 
The impact on livelihood, life, speaks to the heart of my passion for climate action. As a Pacific woman and people living abroad, we continue here to provide financial support and partial care for families, relatives, our villages in the Pacific in response to every cyclone, every tsunami, earthquake and flood that ravish and cause havoc in Tonga and other Pacific islands over the past 40 plus years of my life. So listen, listen to the cry of the earth, a call to action. I am an ordained woman, ordained minister in the Uniting Church here in Sydney, Australia. In the, the church believes that the world and all its life belong to God and so worthy of our deepest respect and care. More than that, the Uniting Church understands that God's will for the world is not that it be ruined or destroyed by the recklessness of human beings, but it be transformed as part of the reconciliation and renewal of all things, which is God's ultimate purpose for creation. Therefore, every act to safeguard, to restore the integrity of the world and its life in this present time has merit and no such action can be dismissed as meaningless. Isn't it timely as I was thinking about this evening to be speaking on this forum during this season of creation 2021 in our liturgical year? We are an ecumenical voice. We all have a responsibility as stewards and members of God's creation to do all that we can. So listen, listen to the cry of the earth, a call for action. I am a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Yes, I am. Who reminds me every day that I am loved, calls me to love my neighbors equally as God loves me. Jesus confronted the powerful leaders of his day about the injustices caused to others, especially the weeks. Friends, I know I'm preaching to the converted here in this space, but my point is this. Jesus spoke up, acted with love and compassion to the weak, the vulnerable, the outcast, the marginalized, and continues to call each one of us the 400 people here and the world to do likewise. When we talk about climate action, I now believe with conviction, Jesus speaks loudly and calls us to act boldly with love and compassion in lobbying the leaders of our time, our government, world leaders, our Pacific people and all people to act. This is an emergency, everyone, my home, the little girl on our screen that Archbishop shared, my school, my hospital, my island is disappearing into the ocean. So listen, listen to the cry of the earth, a call to action. I am a leader. I was appointed quite humbly in August to be moderator of the moderator elect of the Uniting Church for the Synod of New South Wales, and for the Australian Capital Territory, I feel so small in such a hard, huge task. I'll take up the role in 2023. But as I previously stated, I'm not an expert in climate knowledge, let alone global action. But we are all privy to the research and scientific report by the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, as Archbishop referred to, highlighting the urgency to taking action on climate change. In 2019, my church, our Synod, committed itself to the Climate Action Strategy. And there were three things that the church committed to. One was to advocate to all levels of government to reduce greenhouse gas emission. Secondly, to reduce our emission across all parts of the church. And thirdly, to stand with young people, indigenous people, the Pacific and the world in advocacy on global warming. 
As I was reflecting on this, I want to add that the pandemic that we are in has impacted us in all sorts of different ways and it's confronting. However, I wanted to, to note and acknowledge the positive change that we have seen in our environment. The reports show that in 2020, air pollution dropped significantly in comparison to 2029. Even now, the shift to virtual spaces, I think I've learnt and others around me, even my own family, have become more aware of climate justice raised in forums like this and in the United Church, Uniting Church Action Network. In August, again, my church, our synod, committed to the stewardship of the earth and as one of the five key directions of the church for the next 10 years. I wanted to also not have this moment, not share in this forum without acknowledging the, on a national level, the work of Uniting World. Under the leadership of the director, Dr. Sureka, and her team on the ground with partner churches across the Pacific, resourcing community, building capacity, responding to climate disaster. I've been reading a lot about a theology that was developed, a theology of disaster resilience in a changing climate. This was collated by the Reverend Dr. Seth Carroll, but it captures voices of Pacific theologians and leaders. A resource for yes, for us as Pacifica people, but one also most importantly for the world. But I ask you, my brothers and sisters, how long, how long must the Pacific people be resilient? Listen, listen to the voice, to the cry of the earth, a call to action. I am a mother and I'll continue to educate my daughters on what they can do in climate action for justice. I want my children, my children's children, future generation, my descendants to receive God's good earth in the best shape possible. Because you know that eight year old girl huddled in a room with my parents and siblings during cyclone Isaac Isaac in 1982 is crying out with other marginalized voices of the Pacific for world leaders in positions of power to listen, to listen to the cry of the earth and our call to action. Friends, I am just one voice, but I'm a collaborator. And as a Pacific woman, a weaver of life stories and hopefully to empower others. Together, we are better. We are stronger for we are one body with many parts. I believe that climate change does not discriminate because of anyone's color, race, religious beliefs, sexual orientation, or whatever separates us because climate change affects all of us. It is a global issue that calls us to work locally, to work ecumenically, to work collaboratively, to use our voice to act. So listen to the cry of the earth and the call to action. My brothers and sisters in Christ, may we listen to the cry of the earth, a call to action. So tonight I simply want to say, Malo Aupito, Vinaka Vakalevu, thank you very much as I continue to listen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reverend Mutter, for the way that you have brought all these strands together. And our next speaker is Reverend James Bagwan from Fiji, husband to Malin and father to Francisco and Antonia. He currently serves as the General Secretary of the Pacific Conference of Churches. He's been a passionate advocate for ecological stewardship and climate justice. And this is clearly evident in the range of your involvements on the climate ocean nexus, the climate induced displacement, relocation and sovereignty, gender justice, self-determination issues and development narratives. And as if you haven't got enough to do, James, you're also a keen stand up peddler. You spend your spare time 
collecting waste from the ocean. You've represented the Pacific churches and communities at COP23, COP25, and you're expected to attend COP26 in Glasgow in November. We look forward to your emphasis on the quest for justice and dignity for Pacific communities and alternative paths we need to take on development. You're very welcome, James. Maka, Jam, thank you for this opportunity. I begin as we do in our region to acknowledge the custodians of the various places from where we gather online, all part of the sacred creation. I pay my respects to the people whose identity is intertwined with land and sea and give our love and share peace with the elders, the mothers and fathers and children, past, present and future. Thank you for this opportunity. And I really would like to begin by acknowledging um, the sharing, the deep sharing in our Talanoa. Talanoa is the deep sharing of our stories, of our hearts and the deep listening that you are all doing. So Vinakovakalevu to Archbishop Peter Loy Chong, to uh, my sister, Reverend Mata. And uh, I would also like to acknowledge some of our uh, friends who are gathered uh, from the Pacific. We say Malolele, we say Mbolasia, Mbolavinaka, Maori, Talofa. I'd like to acknowledge uh, some friends who are here. Laveta Nalangi Seru from the Pacific Islands Climate Network joining us tonight. And uh, people whose hearts are in Fiji, uh, Rob Floyd from the Uniting Church, uh, Liz Stone from the National Council of Churches in Australia, and my dear friends and brothers in Christ, Father Tom Rouse and Father John McAvoy. Thank you for being with us tonight. And I hope that you also contribute to this story because this is all your stories as well. Archbishop has shared um, with us tonight um, the connection, the deep connection that our Pacific people have with the land and with the sea. It is not just a cultural connection, it is a spiritual connection. It is the way in which we see the world and the way we relate to the world and to each other. And it is the way in which we interpret what is happening in our lives. Reverend Mata has shared with us today the cry of our Pacific people. And really, I, I think what they have shared is our story. And I would just like to add just a few things about where we are in the Pacific, the context, the struggle, the challenges that we, that we face. And the challenge that we face is two, twofold. One is in the context, as we have heard, of the destruction of creation. The fact that we, as God's creation, have dislocated, have torn those sacred bonds that connected us to the rest of creation. We have placed ourselves on top. We have taken the word dominion, which means stewardship, the responsibility given to us by God at the beginning of creation, and turned it into domination. Archbishop has talked about the extractive industries, the extraction of land, the extraction of sea now through deep sea mining, the extraction of our ocean's wealth from fisheries and other resources. And Mata has shared about the impact of climate change, the extreme weather patterns that we experience, the rapid onsets, the cyclones, the storms, the droughts, the floods that are becoming an everyday uh, experience for us. When we were young, the cyclone season was from November to April. It now begins in September. In fact, it, we are already experiencing those strong winds on a regular basis. So the patterns have changed. Our indigenous people can see what is happening. And this is an opportunity for us to speak to what is happening. At the same time, when we look at the issue of rising sea levels, coastal saltwater inundation, we recognize that uh, there is something very wrong that those of us who contribute so little to the world's carbon footprint, the world's carbon emissions, if you think of a footprint, the Pacific does not even qualify as contributing to the nail on the smallest toe of a footprint. 
yet we bear the bootmark of the exploitation of creation by the developed countries, those who refuse to reduce their carbon emissions. So we are talking tonight about justice. And so in, in the Pacific Conference of Churches, where I am uh, very honored to be serving, we do not talk about climate change. We talk from the Pacific about climate justice. This issue is a matter of justice. Mata has shared about what she called climate refugees, her learning about climate refugees. And that is true, except for one very important thing. When we talk about refugees, we talk about refugees in the context of conflicts, where there is a war, where there is a violent uprising and people are temporarily displaced from their homes. But when the conflict ends, they're able to return. If there is a cyclone or a natural disaster, they are relocated. When things get back to normal, they're able to go back and rebuild their lives. The challenge for us in the Pacific in the context of sea level rise is there will be no right of return because there will be nowhere to return to. And so when we talk about the reduction of climate uh, emissions, when we talk about maintaining 1.5 degrees of warming, when we talk about uh, calling out those who are failing to reduce their climate emissions, we are talking about those who are placing a death sentence on the people of the Pacific and in other vulnerable places around the world. This is calling, to the, calling out those who would see island nations disappear. For the first time in history of the Pacific, you will be witnesses to the disappearance of whole nations. Because climate change is about sovereignty. How do you maintain your exclusive economic zone when there are no landmarks under current international law to say, this is our land, this is our territory, it disappears. It then becomes open seas, open for the exploitation of those who would come in to mine the ocean, to rape and pillage the ocean. And I use those words, I know they're strong words, but I use that to talk about what is going to happen when our island nations lose their sovereignty. At the heart of the Pacific peoples facing climate-induced displacement is the question of exile. And I'm sure you all know the hymn, uh, the Psalm, Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon, right? We remember the Psalm, we remember the Boney M version of the song from the 70s. And this is our reality. We have people, and, and Mata has mentioned, uh, Kiribati and Tuvalu, we have the Cataract Islands in the Solomons, we have uh, many other places. We have people in, in bigger islands who live on coastal areas, and Archbishop referred to his own family story. These are people who will be asking the same questions as the Israelites in exile. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? They will be forced to move. And where will they go? They will come, as some have suggested, to Australia to pick your fruit, to work in your horticultural industry, to work in your meatpacking industries. And that is going to be their lot, very much like the Israelites or the Hebrews as they were in oppression in Egypt. That will be their situation, second-class citizens, if that. And our challenge is how do we shift that story from a story of potential exile to one of exodus, where their movement is one that is done with dignity, where there that sense of uprootedness, where people who have, who have buried the umbilical cord of their children under the, or with an, a, a young coconut tree to grow and remain firmly part of the land, these people are being uprooted. So how do we accompany them in that process? How do we ensure justice for them? And so while we talk about in the context of COP26 or the COP meetings, the issue of reducing emissions, there is the issue of strengthening adaptation and resilience to the climate impacts. But then there is the very real issue of loss and damage. 
we find that our Pacific family in the developed countries, and here I refer to you as my family in Australia, are very good to talk about climate adaptation and mitigation funds, the government. But they try and tie that in with development aid. And this is blood money, if I am to be honest. This is not being willing to make the changes that need to be made, not being willing to move out of the comfort zone of corporate greed and just paying off the Pacific Islands. But I come with you to come to you today with not just the cry of the Pacific, but with a warning, a warning from the Pacific. We are on the forefront of climate change in the Pacific region, your sisters and brothers in the islands. But so are you. The extreme weather patterns that will ex you will experience will be a little bit different, but they will still be the result of climate change. The rising sea levels will affect your coastal areas. The coral bleaching will affect your Great Barrier Reef and other reefs. Their ocean acidification will affect your seas, your coast, your fisher people. And the phytoplankton that, as Archbishop says, produces 70% of the world's oxygen will die and you will have less oxygen to breathe. The droughts that we experience will be experienced by you. The floods that we experience will be experienced by you. The extreme weather patterns will not only affect the Pacific, they will affect you as well. So this is our prophetic message. We speak of what is happening to us and we call you to think about what will happen to you. The prophet Micah calls us to act justly, love mercy and walk humbly with our God. You have a prime minister who professes his faith quite openly. Call him to live his faith. Those in government that profess this faith, call them to live their faith, to put the faith at the heart of the decisions that they make about the climate and remind them this is not about a changing climate, this is about justice. Thank you and God bless you all. Thank you so much, Reverend James, for your passion your advocacy and your prophetic message, which we need to take on board. And our final speaker tonight is Bishop Vincent Long. Vincent is the first Vietnamese born bishop to lead a diocese outside of Vietnam. He came to Australia as a refugee in 1981 and later became a conventual Franciscan. After his ordination, on the 30th of December 1989, he went to Rome for further studies and was awarded a licentiate in Christology and Spirituality from the Pontifical Faculty of St Bonaventure. He was appointed an Auxiliary Bishop in Melbourne in 2011. But in 2016, as a gift to all of us, he was installed as the fourth Bishop of Parramatta. Nationally, he serves, the chair, he serves as the chair of the Bishop's Commission for Social Justice, Service and Mission. Tonight, Vincent, you will speak to us about the recently released, released Australian Catholic Bishops Conference Social Justice Statement 2021-2022, Cry of the Earth, Cry of the Poor. Vincent, we welcome you and your call to us to stand with and for the tidal wave of justice. Welcome. Thank you very much, Jan, for your kind words of introduction. And I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land where we gather respectively. Here in Western Sydney, it's the land of the Darug people. I thank, um, the organizers for this opportunity to share the podium with um, three eminent speakers. Um, <clears throat> as we listen to their, their voice, um, we discerned uh, uh, a sense of conviction, passion, 
and a deep pathos for their people. Um, climate change, climate justice from a lived experience, from um, the margins of the, the world. So we thank them from the bottom of our hearts. Yes, uh, <clears throat> the effects of climate change are everywhere for us to see. And the consensus is almost universal that it is caused by human activities, unless you are a kind of Rip Van Winkle who has led through decades of research by cl climate scientists, or unless you have chosen to live in the world of alternative facts, which many do, unfortunately, as demonstrated by this pandemic. The Australian Bishop's Social Justice Statement this year, here I have a hard copy, <clears throat> um, calls fellow Catholics to listen to the signs of the times with open hearts. Listening to our farming communities across the nation, we would know that fires, floods and droughts have become less predictable, but more intense. Listening to our indigenous people, we would be aware that the ecological crisis is especially painful because of their deep connection to country, just as the Pacific people have a deep connection also to land, to country, and especially to sea. Along with the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor, we also hear the cry of the young. They see their future being threatened. They want change as a matter of intergenerational justice. Australia's Pacific neighbors are some of the, of the worst countries impacted by climate change. I think it's obvious as um, uh, those testimonies of the, my uh, three co-speakers um, have given. So we cannot um, go on the way we have. We cannot continue to destroy the rainforests. We pollute the environment, burn fossil fuels without dire consequences. Scientists predict, predicted long ago that extreme weather events would happen if carbon emissions were not reduced. And these predictions have come and continue to come to pass with devastating effects. During this uh, pandemic, political leaders everywhere, by and large, have followed the advice of scientists in enacting public health policies that prevent or at least contain the spread of the virus and protect life. Unfortunately, though, there has not been a strong and decisive leadership when it comes to fighting climate change. Instead of uniting behind science and enacting favorable public policies, many nations, including Australia, have regressed and even reneged on the Paris Climate Accord, which limits global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above the long-term average to reduce the worst impacts of climate change. Australia's current climate policies are viewed globally as among the worst in the world. Our prime minister, our current prime minister has flatly refused to commit to a legislate net zero emissions targets, even when most of our major trading partners have done so. Therefore, Australia will effectively be abandoning the Paris Agreement unless it makes at least 50% cut in greenhouse gas emissions um, in less than 20 years and reaches a net zero well before 2050. As a nation, we cannot claim to be a responsible global citizen in ad addressing the moral challenge of our age while we lag behind other nations on climate action and continue, continue sadly to subsidize old polluting industries. 
Yes, it is true that we are only responsible for a comparatively small amount of carbon emissions, but there's no reason not to act and to show leadership. Australia has always prided itself on punching above its own weight. As Sir David Attenborough remarked, that we are the keepers of an extraordinary section of the surface of this planet, including the Great Barrier Reef. And what we say, and what we do matters. As Australia and most countries prepare for their post COVID 19 economic recovery, it is crucial that we don't dig ourselves out of one crisis only to exacerbate another. Scientists are confident that, that they, they will be able to develop a, a vaccine, and they have, but unfortunately, climate crisis that threatens to wipe out small Pacific nations cannot be addressed with a vaccine. So we need a radical new way of living that brings harmony and sustainability to all of life. Even if and when we get back to post-COVID normal, we need to think and act differently. We need to rewire ourselves to be in communion with one another as a human family and as part of nature. We need to abandon the old paradigm of competition, the survival of the fittest that undergirds much of our capitalist economic system, a system of buying life at all costs. We will perish under these conditions unless we return to the roots of nature and rewire ourselves to be part of nature. We need a, a conversion of mind and heart that leads to a conversion of lifestyle. Each of us can begin to live life simply and poorly. Australia is the largest exporter of coal, but individually, we are also responsible for producing huge amounts of greenhouse gases. We have one of the highest per capita emissions of carbon dioxide in the world. We simply cannot leave the greenhouse problem to big players, energy companies, industry leaders, and the like. There are practical measures that we can all do to reduce our carbon footprint, invest in renewable energy, divest from fossil fuels, consume less and waste less must be the way for us Christians to, to, to give new expressions to the first beatitude, to live the spirit of poverty and simplicity. Pope Francis often speaks of a culture of globalized indifference. <clears throat> Australians and Christian Australians in particular need to build a broad coalition gathering around what is described as the moral challenge of our time in order to give a counter witness to the political inertia the vested interests of the industrial complex and even the general apathy. We need to amplify the prophetic voice of Pope Francis. It will reverberate through our parishes, schools, communities, and the broader society. It will inspire what I'm call a new Laudato Si generation. And together we can bring the urgent message of reconciliation and healing for our broken earth. The social statement, a social justice statement says, when it comes to human knowledge of the lands and waters, now known as Australia, First Nations peoples are our first teachers. Now is the time for us to learn from our indigenous wisdom of giving back to the land what it needs for regeneration instead of endless extraction. Today, we are just beginning to appreciate this ancient wisdom more and more. Whereas our commodity driven culture seeks to extract things from the land and country and the sea, our indigenous brothers and sisters acknowledge and celebrate the radical interdependence and reciprocity within the diverse webs of life. It is they who teach us the importance of safeguarding Mother Earth's delicate balance and the healthy conditions for life to thrive. 
sadly though, that delicate balance is at the point of collapse. We are facing an ecological crisis and the message of Laudato Si could not have been more poignant. Pope Francis wants the whole church globally to act with greater sense of urgency. Laudato Si provides us with this new direction, which centers on the strengthening of relational wholeness of everything and everyone. As a result, all our efforts must, must be at the service of our fellow human beings and environment. A technological and economic development which does not leave in its wake a better world and an integrally, integrally higher quality of life cannot be considered progress. Laudato Si, 194. Francis recognizes that the contradiction between economic growth and the Earth's ecological balance cannot be considered progress because too often people's quality of life actually diminishes by the deterioration of the environment, the low quality of food, or the depletion of resources in the midst of economic growth. He argues that we can't pursue capitalist or even renewable growth and simultaneously reverse the breakdown of ecological commons. So we must learn that less is more. We must learn to envision a new economy that shifts away from consumption and exploitation to one that celebrates radical interdependence and reciprocity. Only by taking less from the earth, we can move to an alternative model of living in radical harmony and deep connection with the planet. This new consciousness and way of living opens new possibilities. It moves us from scarcity to abundance, from extraction to regeneration, from dominion or domination that Reverend James spoke about to reci reciprocity, from ruthless exploitation to responsible stewardship, from separation to connection, with all that is around us. Guided by the gospel message of the kingdom at hand and open to a world of change, the church can live up to its prophetic call to be a beacon of hope for humanity. We can be an alternative relational paradigm for those on the margins where the poor and the forgotten can be brought into a new unity. The church that advocates life at all costs and promotes peaceful life in war-torn and violent world. The church that models justice in an age of greed, consumerism and power. The church centered on the reason Christ, empowering a consciousness of the whole. So may the example of Mary MacKillop inspire us to embody that kingdom vision of Christ and become a lighthouse for the world. Or in the words of Pope Francis again, if we want a different world, we must become a different people. May our efforts to change the trajectory of the ecological crisis and align the future of our planet to God's intention be brought to fruition. Thank you. <clears throat> We're deeply indebted to you, Vincent, but to each of our speakers tonight for your passion, your wisdom and insights, and the inspiration of your summons to us to both conversion and action. We've heard this story of loss and damage, the fearful reminder that the Pacific is the bootmark for the rest of us who are witnesses to the disappearance of the sacred lands of our sisters and brothers and that we're called, as you reminded us, Vincent, beyond globalised indifference. You've given us much to think about. You've reminded us powerfully of how intrinsically we are part of Earth and part of each other, and that this very truth should outlaw indifference. Indeed, we can't isolate ourselves and our own comfort, while across the Pacific, 
and indeed across our entire planet, our sisters and brothers, our lands and creatures are suffering and disappearing from Earth. You call us, each of you, to speak truth to power, both as we prepare for COP26, but also in our common journey in the years ahead. You've reminded us that we do have choices and you summon us to enact them, to bring healing, hope and a new world order. The challenge is a huge one, but you help us to hope and to believe it's possible. Your presence with us tonight has been pure gift. Thank you. And I'm aware that we're running out of time, Corinne, and I'm not sure how you want to take this next part forward, but I'd like to call on you who will lead the next 10 minutes of our time together. Thank you, Jan, and thank you indeed to all of our speakers. We have 270 people on this call, and if you're not inspired to take action now, I don't know what can inspire you because those presentations were absolutely magnificent, and thank you so much. Um, I um, was going to take a Q&A, but I think because we've, um, we've got, we're running a little bit late, I want to jump to climate action because you know, with the urgency of the situation that we are facing, we just cannot afford not to talk about what we each, as members of the Australian um, and Pacific Christian community, um, can do to uh, make a difference. So um, I'm not going to take long and we'll get on to questions, uh, but I did want to cover that um, first. So we have to understand, um, and, I, and I, my background is, is a campaigning background, that, um, you know, we can make such a difference. And the 270 people on this call and the 450 people who have registered for this event and their networks can make a huge difference. And what we really need to do now is to boost uh, activation of those networks ahead of COP26. It's very, very important. And it's, um, I think that it's, um, you know, it's, it's, well, I feel like having listened to those speakers, um, it's really important to actually take action, not just to listen, but to take action. So I would like to um, propose to you three areas that you may be able to um, take action. And you don't need to take notes because we will be following up um, with all the information about each of these area, uh, these areas in an email to you early next week. So there's no, there's no, um, there's no need to take notes. Um, the first uh, area that I would like to uh, highlight to you is the campaign by the Australian Religious Response to Climate Change um, to put banners. Um, promoting climate action by our Australian leaders on places of worship. So this can be churches, um, you know, other places of worship, or just buildings that belong to congregations. It could be a Catholic school. It could be any building that has an affiliation with, um, with a, a, a faith organization. And there is a, a campaign link, uh, which my colleague Smita is going to paste into the chat shortly for this campaign. It's very easy. The banner process is organized through the Australian Religious Response for Climate Change. So all you need to do is to sign up. They even suggest uh, possible messages for the banners. Super easy to do and really powerful because very visual. People of faith carry, um, carry a special place in Australian society. And um, it's a really powerful thing to do um, to actually put a banner on places of worship. Um, Smita, my colleague, has now uh, paste that link into the chat if you want more information about that. But as I said, we will be contacting you early next week with more information about that. The second area that I would suggest is signing the Laudato Si petition. 
um, which is an international petition um, that Smita, my colleague, is also going to paste into the link. And by signing this petition, you will certainly join, if you haven't already, an international uh, movement of faith um, that is taking action on climate change. So I think that's quite an important thing to do. And the third area, which, I, which I'd like to announce tonight, is this webinar will kick off uh, our uh, campaign, the campaign by the Edmund Rice Center ahead of COP26, um, which is a letter writing campaign. And it is called Stand With Tossi. And um, I have a special uh, guest tonight, and that is Tossi herself. And um, I'd like to introduce her to you. Just read out about Tossi. Tossi was born and grew up on the island of Tarawa in Kiribati. She's currently volunteering uh, at the Edmund Rice Center with the Pacific Calling Partnership. Tossi comes from a small family. She's the eldest child of two younger sisters and studied at the Missionaries of the Sacred Heart Chevalier High School in Kiribati. She then trained and lived with the Good Samaritan Sisters for more than four years. As you will see when you meet her, Tossi is a quiet, dignified, and yet strong and passionate advocate about how climate change is affecting her Pacific Island and the need to take action. This year, she participated in uh, our climate leadership training, which we organized in Western Sydney earlier this year. And this training has motivated her to be vocal on the issue of climate change and to become more active in this area of climate action. And Tossi has uh, now become the face of the campaign, which will release early next week for uh, letter writing to our Australian leaders. And I'd like to introduce her to you tonight um, and have a quick chat to her so you can meet her. Tossi, are you there? Yes. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Māori, Māori, Tossi. Māori, Māori. So, welcome, welcome. And um, I wanted to ask you a few questions about yourself because this campaign is going to be our flagship, camp flagship campaign at the Edmund Rice Center ahead of COP26. As a young woman from Kiribati, why are you so passionate about the issue of climate change? Well, and she's dropped out. Ah, oh, these things always happen. Something had to go wrong. All right, we'll come back to Tossi. Um, and uh, again, don't worry about taking this information down because um, we will be uh, emailing you uh, early next week. So what I might do while we wait for Tossi to come back is actually to take some of your questions. Um, and I'll start with a question by Jill Finane. Jill, are you there? Jill? Oh, yes. <laughs> you want to ask your question? Oh, all right. Well, I can't get the exact words because there have been so many other things in the chat since. But um, yes, I, I, you know, we're, we are all trying to act and we belong to NGOs that are acting, many of us. But um, it would really be wonderful if we could see more leadership in support of our actions from, the from all the various aspects of the institutional church. I think as some people have said in the chat later, there is a resounding silence. Ex present company accepted, <laughs> very much accepted. It's wonderful the, the leadership we've had from the, the um, uh, uh, people here tonight. But um, yes, that's, that's my question. And is there some way that we can hope for that to happen? I suppose as a Catholic, I'm particularly thinking of the Catholic Church in Australia. Bishop Longa, I think that might be a question for you. Sorry, I was 
I was distracted a little bit. Can you just uh, re repeat the question, please? Bishop Long, um, all of us who are keen to act and belong to organizations that are acting, uh, particularly us Australians, um, what can we hope for in terms of leadership from the institutional church to um, support the work that we are feel we are called to do? Um, thank you, Jill. Um, I, 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 um, um, I speak for my um, um, commission, uh, the Commission for Social Justice, which has a carriage of um, the issue of um, ecology uh, and justice uh, and peace, um, uh, and perhaps broadly for my um, brethren uh, in the Episcopate. Um, I, I do think that um, this is not a, um, um, an issue that, uh, that is at the margins of um, the church, uh, especially with the leadership of Pope Francis. Um, and of course, the, 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 um, the publication of um, Laudato Si. And as you can see, the, uh, the Australian um, bishops um, annual statement, uh, which uh, refocuses on um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the need for action uh, on climate justice. And, and so um, uh, in particular, I think this statement is, is quite um, uh, action oriented, you know, with the seven specific goals and, and the, uh, the, 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 um, the action platforms. Uh, provided by the uh, Gastri for Integral Human Development. So um, um, I, I do think that there is a, uh, um, a, a general um, um, uh, concern and a, um, uh, um, a, a, a sense of um, uh, <clears throat> uh, urgency on, on the matter at hand. So I, um, uh, you know, uh, especially with, with, the, um, with the idea that the church itself or churches must be examples, must be places of sustainability, uh, uh, places where, um, climate justice is um, embraced. So um, um, I think uh, it's a journey that, uh, that, that uh, the leadership of the church in Australia has committed itself to quite um, um, strongly and, and decisively, Jill. Yeah. Thank you, Bishop Long. Um, very difficult, um, tricky question to answer. Um, so we, we all appreciate that. Um, Langi, you had um, from, Langi joins us from the Pacific Islands uh, Climate Action Network. Did you have a question? Thank you, Corinne. Yes, I, I did have a question. I'm just scrolling through the chat to find that. Um, so the question is to our esteemed uh, panelist, from your theological perspective, do you think that the argument of advancing development and job creation through fossil fuel industries still carries any merit? And we know that Australia you know, is one of the largest coal producers in the world um, and you know, is shaping up to be the villain in the COP26 climate talks as well as becoming you know, increasingly isolated from the rest of the world with its obstinate uh, approach to the climate crisis. So that's the, the question I, I wanted to ask. Thank you. Uh, 
Who would like to answer that? Thank you, Corinne. Thank you, Labetana Langi, for your uh, question. I think it's a very important one. The, you know, I, I at the last COP meeting, uh, Langi, you may remember, I, in a panel with uh, the former president of uh, Kiribati and uh, former prime minister of um, Tuvalu and the Marshall Islands Climate Envoy, we sat at the panel and, and I, I, I spoke on, um, on the challenge of loving your neighbor. God calls us to love God with all our heart, our soul, our mind, our body, our strength, and to love our neighbor as, our, as we love ourselves. And this comes back to the challenge about Australia or the Australian government's uh, relationship as members of the Pacific family. But it actually speaks to more than that. It speaks to the fact that this uh, focus on capitalism really has failed. And that's what the climate extinction rebellion in the Northern Hemisphere is talking about. They, we have the young Greta's and others who are saying capitalism has failed. And capitalism has gone hand in hand with colonialism and now neo-colonialism. So we need to have a shift from uh, politics of scarcity to, polit to recognizing that we are people who live in abundance. And that's something that indigenous communities in Australia, indigenous communities in Pacific and the Philippines and around the world recognize that even when we are technically poor by World Bank standards, we are rich. We are rich because we have our identity. We, have our, we are rich because we know that the fish, our supermarket is in the ocean and in the land. Um, so it's, it's a call for us to really, the climate crisis, the call for the ecological conversion by Pope Francis in Laudato Si is a call to a new way, a better way as Paul writes it when he talks about the way of love, eh? of agape. And it's really about putting well-being first instead of economic development. Instead of GDP, we should measure the success of a country or the progress of a country and the development of a country in well-being and how its people are living. And we can see that already with huge mental health issues, huge drug issues, huge every other issue, huge crime, huge lots of people in prisons, that well-being is not at the center of what we do. And the second is that we need to put creation or to put a, a secular word to it, put biodiversity at the center of all development projects. This is not just what churches are calling for. This is not just what Laudato Si is calling for. This is what the global conservation agencies are calling for as well. The recent uh, IUCN, the um, International Union for the Conservation of Nature, their recent uh, gatherings this year spoke about putting biodiversity, which is creation at the heart of everything we do. And not just saying, well, how can we mitigate the damage we're doing to the environment? Let's, let's actually put that in the center, remembering that we as human beings are part of the ecosystem. The, the, the other issue really comes down to the fact that the shifts that we'll need to make to respond to the climate crisis, the changes that will need to happen in economies, in industries, will lead to new jobs. This will happen. As we green the economies, as we say, as we move away from certain industries, new industries will come up. Now, what we're asking for is for political leaders who have the courage to put their political capital on the line and say, I'm putting my political future on the line for the future of our people. We have seen this being done in, in, in other countries, but we're not seeing that happen in, in Australia. And so we need to call that out. And we need to, to say that there is a future, there is a positive future, a good future, um, if we make those transitions. And the real question is, what are we willing to give up in order to make that happen? And that's the million dollar or trillion dollar question. Thank you, Reverend Bagwan. I'm very conscious of the time. And um, I just wanna know whether Tossie's back on the call. Tossie, are you there? Oh, she'll be so disappointed. She really um, wanted to 
uh, introduce herself to you. Um, but you'll meet her uh, as the face of our campaign when we email you uh, early next week. Uh, but uh, she, I'm sure she'll be very disappointed. Um, uh, look, I'm very conscious of the time. It's 6.35. Um, I just, um, I'll, let, I'll leave it to Phil, the director of the Edmund Rice Center, um, to, uh, to give final uh, thanks and close the meeting. But I just really wanted to thank myself, you know, all of you for participating and to our wonderful, wonderful speakers. Uh, you know, it's just, you've made a real fantastic contribution. And um, we look forward, I look forward to uh, staying in touch with all of you and growing this network of members of the Australian Christian community who are prepared to take action on climate change and speak up. So this is, this is not the end, it's actually the beginning or the continuation of the many seeds that have been planted uh, for the last few years. Um, over to you, Phil. Well, thank you, Corinne. And um, I'll endorse what you've just said there to thank everybody for attending the, from across the region. Um, We've really had an ecumenical night. We've had a night of uh, profound honesty um, that often pointed at the, at the problem we all face, but also towards, uh, as James was saying there, towards some solutions. Um, I just want to say um, I attended the Pacific Island Forum in um, a couple of years back in, in Tuvalu. Uh, and I've got to say, I was absolutely ashamed, ashamed, of Australia's position and Australia's behaviour towards the Pacific. Um, and I want to say to our Pacific brothers and sisters who are on this, this call tonight that we will work together to try and do better. Um, and it's a, it's a shame that our politicians couldn't hear the cry from the, of the, of the ocean peoples tonight. Uh, and for those of us who heard it, I think it's our responsibility to take that, that voice mm -hmm. in the spirit of Talanoa of deep sharing to people who think they don't need to hear it. Um, that's our collective challenge. And uh, I wanna thank our speakers uh, uh, particularly for doing that. Um, I'll come back to them. I wanna thank uh, a few people who made this, this webinar happen in particular, the, the staff of the Edmund Rice Center, uh, Smita, Maria, Tossi, Jill, Jaffa, Father Claude and Sean, um, you know who you are. Uh, special people who advised us, Father Ras, my old mate, Bishop Philip Huggins in Melbourne, Jackie Redmond and Lanyon and Sue Martin. Um, many people who've helped promote this webinar around the region, including but not limited to Joe Hart at Edmund Rice, Christina at the Diocese of Parramatta, the Australian Religious Response to Climate Change, Marisa and Marita at ERC, and special thanks to Jan Barnett, who very soon should probably get her own talk show. Uh, thanks again, Jan, for your, uh, your chairing. And also to Corinne, who's facilitated this and has been the driving force behind tonight. I think you've done a, a, a fabulous job. This was a great webinar. This was a great webinar. Um, Jan started with a, with a poem from um, Seamus Heaney talking about hope and history rhyming. And this is, we're on the cusp of history being shifted in the way of sustainability and of protecting the earth and the planet. And those voices of those four people we heard tonight, uh, Archbishop Peter Chong, Reverend Marta Hiliao, Reverend James Bhagwan, and our friend and colleague, Bishop Vincent Long from Parramatta, that's the call that we respond to in action. Corinne's outlined three things we can do. Please, let's do as much as we can of that and more. Um, there's another saying that often goes with, uh, with, with the uh, Seamus Haney, Haney poem, and it's that the, you all would have heard it, that the arc of justice is long, but it bends, sorry, the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. What they don't say when, they, when that comes up is that it takes people to do the bending. It takes people to do the bending. And so if, at this moment in our history, let's get the banners outside our institutions, our churches, our schools, our organisations. Let's sign the Laudato Si petition and let's stand with Tossie. We mightn't have seen much of her tonight. She's here, she's here, Phil. 
She's here. Back. She's made a return. <laughs> Good on you, Tosh. Really, the last word for you is anything you'd like to say before we go. Tossi, um, yes. can you tell us a little bit about why you're so passionate about climate change? Um, I am passionate about this issue because I know what it feels like to be in the front line of the climate crisis. And I really want to help my people by raising awareness about it to the world. And I'm hoping that we we can all live on our land without uh, worried about our future. And Tossi, you've been with us for, for a few months now at the Pacific Calling Partnership. Um, why did you uh, decide and accept uh, this role as the face of our campaign heading into COP26? Oh, I think she's gone again. <laughs> Oh, she'll be so disappointed. All right. Well, look, at least you've, I think, you've I met think her. That, I think it's apt, Corinne, that we give her the last word. Yes, that's right. That's Thank exactly right. Thank you, everybody, right. for coming. Thank you for your organisation. Thank you for the inspiration from the speakers. Have a great weekend. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Can you send the video? Uh, yes. We will be we will be sending the recording next week to you and to all of the people who registered as well, as well as information about um, about how you can take climate action heading into COP26. Thank you. Okay. Well done, well done to the organizers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Have have a good weekend wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, Jen. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah. Hello. Thank you very much. It was wonderful. Good. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Claire Antaraya is there.